Welcome to another episode of Money You Should Ask, where everyone has something they can teach you. I'm your host, Bob Wheeler. In this episode, we are going to explore why we do what we do when it comes to money. As a CPA for the past 30 years, wait, let me say 25 because that makes me sound younger. I have seen it all when it comes to money and emotions. And if you think I'm talking about my clients, I'm not. I'm talking about myself. My relationship with money has been, and sometimes still is, an emotional roller coaster. Maybe that's something you're also familiar with. Good news. You and I are not the only ones. Our next guest is going to share their money beliefs, money blocks, and life challenges as well. Buckle your seatbelt and enjoy the ride. Our next guest, Dustin Heiner, is a rental property expert and founder of masterpassiveincome.com. After being successfully unemployed at 37 years old by investing in real estate rental properties, he is now on a mission to use his podcast, books, courses, and coaching to help other people do the same thing. Dustin helps his students build successful real estate investing businesses all over the country. Dustin started masterpassiveincome.com from his home in 2015 while still being full time employee, married with four kids owning and operating two other businesses, and being a full-time investor. He was obviously bored. 2015, Dustin also wrote his first book, How to Quit Your Job with Rental Properties, which quickly became a bestseller. Dustin, welcome to the show. Hey, Bob. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I just love talking about money because it's not money that I love. It's what it affords me to do in my life and be with my family and all that sort of stuff. So I really appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Well, we're going to talk about that because there's so many people out there that want to be able to do the things they want and don't quite know how to get past those blocks or beliefs. And hopefully they'll get some great insight today and be able to move it forward. So Dustin, the first question I have for you really is when you were a kid, did you want to be a real estate mogul? Was that the idea at six years old? That's a great question. No, definitely not. But at the same time, I've always been entrepreneurial in a sense where, so my mom and my dad got divorced. And so my stepdad, he had his business. He was a contractor. So I worked for him doing framing houses in the summertime when I wasn't at school. But my biological dad also had his own business. And so I've always been entrepreneurial. And so I even had, like I started at 13 years old, had my own paper route where you have your bicycle and you get the papers and you throw them really hard and bang the garage door. I had a graphic and website design company through high school and college, a skateboard manufacturing business, and even a pizzeria and convenience store. So I've always been trying to figure out a way to work for myself, not necessarily get away from working for somebody else, but I've always been entrepreneurial. So yes, from a young age, I just knew that I wanted to be independent. And when you were growing up and just knowing you wanted to do these different things, did your mom, your dad, your stepdad, did they ever talk to you directly about money? Was it just stuff you observed? What kind of conversations around money happened as a kid? It really centered around don't go into debt. That's literally all it was. It wasn't about saving, how to make more money, how to get different streams of income, all that sort of stuff. I didn't even know what passive income was. When I found out, that was kind of crazy. But as I was going through life, it was just basically don't go into debt. Probably because my parents didn't really know. They didn't have good financial literacy. We were basically lower middle class, if not even lower class when we first, that's my first born and started growing up. Eventually, my parents got better jobs, and so they made more money, but at the same time, went into debt. So they were trying to teach me not to do what they did. That makes sense. Now, because you were starting to do your own thing and making money and paper route, stuff like that, did you get an allowance or that was just not on the table? I want to say I got a little allowance. I don't know, $5. But when I got a paper route, they stopped doing that. Now, here's something that I do. I definitely got to share what I do now. I I don't do what my parents did because they did give me an allowance. It was very small, but it was still an allowance. But what I do with my kids now, we have four kids. And so if you're able to watch this, I got four kids in the background. And so with my four kids, what I literally do is I try to teach them because I was never taught this stuff. Financial literacy is so fantastic. So my kids don't get an allowance at all. Like it's a privilege to be in the family. And daddy doesn't get paid just to be alive. Like you guys have to work too, and that's your chores, but you don't get paid for that. What they do get paid for though, is what we homeschool. And let me take that back. My wife does the homeschooling. My wife has the hard job of homeschooling kids. I had the easy job of making money. And so when we're doing homeschooling, 
they'll finish a book, uh, like a math book for the semester or whatever. We pay them $10 because that's their, I'm giving that, that incentive. Like this is your job. You get one book done and you get paid $10. Now, fast forward to what I'm teaching them is when you make $10 or make any money at all, this is what we're going to do. We're going to figure out how to deviate that up, which is what I should have been taught. I wish I was taught. But first, 10% goes to God, like goes to church, goes to giving. 10% is for other people. Then 50% of the whole we put into savings. And we also put into a savings account. They could see the computer and see, oh, we made 20 cents this month. That's great. You know, little kids. So 50% goes to savings. But at the same time, 20% of the whole goes to mommy, not them, goes to mommy to help pay for responsibilities like food on our table, electricity, bed sheets, all that sort of stuff that they realize that just because you make money doesn't mean you get to spend it all on whatever you want. We have responsibilities. The last 20%, they could do whatever they want with it. Put it in savings, give it to God, give it to mommy, spend it themselves. It's been a blessing where my kids, even at the same time, like, you know what? I want to give mommy an extra dollar this time. I'm like, well, that's so great. Or I want to give more to church or put more into savings or I put all my money in savings. So I'm really helping my kids as best I can from the very young age, save, obviously not going to debt because that's a huge lesson as well, but then also responsibilities and tithing as well. Yeah, I think that's great. And it's funny that you talk about paying them for the books. You know, I've heard some people say, well, that's bribing your kids. Maybe. But the other thing I saw somebody was saying, you know, I pay my kid a dollar a book he reads and the kids read 120 books this year and he thinks he's <laughs> ripped me off and it's the best investment I've ever made. The power of reading just can't be overemphasized. It is just an amazing gift to be able to read. Absolutely. And But just think about what your boss does. Your boss pays you for whatever it is that they're requiring you to do. Maybe your boss wants you to read a bunch of books to learn to be something better. You're getting paid to do that just because your kid's not doing it. You need, I personally think, like I get encouraged when somebody gives me an incentive to do something. And so with my kids too. Oh, another thing, when we go to church, if they write down what they hear in the sermon, they get 20 minutes on the iPad. We give out minutes on the iPad very sparingly. In fact, they very rarely ever get on it, but that's an incentive. Right. I am not against incentivizing them because you're right. If you've read 120 books, you made 120 bucks. Like the dollars is minuscule compared to the books that you're reading. Yeah. I'm absolutely not against utilizing incentive to help our kids to learn. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you talk about the kids have a budget and part of it goes to mommy and she's doing a lot of the hard work for sure. Did you and your wife have any conversations about money before you got married? And how do you have conversations about money now that you're married? Okay, so let me also give you a little story about something that happened to us that really catapulted me and to be where I am today, quote unquote, being successfully unemployed. I retired or quit my job when I was 37 years old. Now I just have businesses and stuff like that. But let me, if you don't mind, I can tell you a quick story that helps us get in this direction. So before we got married, we would talk a lot about money. She was a saver. She's very frugal, which I'm super blessed. I have some friends that say, oh, my wife, she just spent $1,000. I just looked at the credit card statement like, where did this $1,000 go? My wife's the opposite. She'll say, hey, honey, she call me up. Can I buy this thing? It's like $2.50. I'm like, yes, absolutely. Go right ahead, babe. And so I'm blessed in that regard. So she's a saver. But I, again, remember, I wasn't. I'm just don't go into debt. That's the biggest thing that I want to make sure that I didn't do. And so that was a big conversation. And at the same time, I read the book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is a terrific book. Everybody should read it. 100%. <laughs> you learn about passive income where you work one time and you get paid over and over and over and over again. And that blew my mind because we're all taught, I'm taught, when you go to school, you go to school, get good grades, go to college, get good grades, then get a job, get good reviews, and you retire when you're 65 years old. And that never sat well with me. But then when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I was like, oh my goodness, like there's another way. Let me see if I can figure this out. But here's a quick story that I want to share with you that got us into this direction where we are now. So the conversations that we have now about money is almost like non-existent because we're blessed to be able to make money from the real estate that we own, where we obviously we're frugal. That's number one. We save two on top of that because we implemented that into our lives, but we're also making a lot of money where it's like, well, we don't live above our means. We just keep saving the rest of the money. So here's what catapulted us into being where we now have a plenty of money. So I'm working a regular county job or you know regular nine to five job. I work for in California, working for a county there in California, doing IT or technology work. And we're having kid after kid. I'm still being entrepreneurial, but I'm still focused on that full time. I call it J-O-B, just overbroke job. And so once we had our fourth child and 
I go on paternity leave with that fourth child. And that's where the dad stays home with the mom and bonds with the baby, changes poopy diapers and stuff like that. And you're gone for about a week. And so I come back and the week that I get back, I get a call from my boss's 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 secretary, like the top dog. His secretary gives me a call and says, Dustin, would you please come to the boss's office? And I was like, okay. And I hung up the phone. I thought, man, this is Friday at 3.30. This is weird. I normally don't get called to the boss's office in general. Like, I wonder what's going on. And as I'm sitting there, I pause for a second. And I start thinking, man, about two months ago, before I went on paternity leave, there was some rumors or some rumblings going on that there could potentially be layoffs. And I immediately shuck that off. I'm like, no way. I've got 12, 13 years of seniority here. Like, I'm doing really well. They give me raises all the time. I shook that off. So I get up and I walk down the hallway to the boss's office. And as I walk down the hallway, Bob, even though it's a short hallway, <laughs> it feels like it gets longer and longer and longer. And it feels like my feet turn into lead or concrete bl- bricks as I walk and gets harder and harder because it's starting to dawn on me that I could potentially get laid off. Like the weight of the world is starting to come on my shoulders because my wife just had her fourth kid, like literally two weeks prior. And so I got three kids and the new baby on. And so as I'm walking down the hallway, these things are going through my head. But then I turn the corner and I get to my boss's office. His door's closed, but I see his secretary right there. And she's a super nice lady. And sheepishly, she grins at me and says, Dustin, would you please have a seat? And I go and sit down and she's consoling me with her eyes because she knows everything about what's going on. I know nothing right. about what's going on. And as I'm sitting there, I start thinking about my children. I start thinking about all these years that I built towards working to have a career. I start thinking, is this all going to be taken away from me? Like, was that time wasted? And I started really thinking, well, what does that make me if I can't feed my family? What does that make me as a father? Does that make me a failure as a father? Does that make me a failure as a husband, as a man trying to provide for his family? Well, as I'm sitting there, my hands get all clammy. My forehead gets all sweaty because it's really starting to eat at me. And then the door to my boss's office opens up. And out walks a coworker, a lady, with a piece of paper in her hand. And she's noticeably distraught, noticeably upset. But she's not necessarily crying. But you can tell her world has absolutely been rocked. As she passes by me, my boss says, Dustin, would you please come into the office? And so I go into his office and I get laid off. And remember, this is the government. Nobody gets fired or laid off from the government, but I did. And the saying is absolutely true. It's not if you get laid off or lose your job, it's when right. it's going to happen. So I take that layoff notice and I walk back to my desk and I sit down and I realize two things right then and there, Bob. And I want everybody else to also kind of get this idea inside them, like learn from my mistake or learn from what I did. So the first one thing that I learned or realized that I need to get another job. I need to be able to provide for my family, put food on the table, roof over heads. So what I did was I was blessed to get another job in another department. I called around and another department in the county. So I didn't actually get laid off. It was fantastic. The second thing, this is what I would love everybody to realize is that your value is so much more than anybody could ever ever pay you. And the reason why you know this, you actually can know this. Your boss is only paying you just enough to keep you working without quitting, but not so much that's taking money out of their pocket. And so if you realize this, your value is worth so much more than anybody could pay you, you start realizing, oh my goodness, when somebody asks me the question, Dustin, what is it that you do? I used to say, I work for the county government. I do IT. They're basically asking me the value that I put on myself. I was putting in my job. From that point forward, I said, I am never going to tell anybody what my job is as my value. I'm now going to tell everybody I am an investor, a real estate investor. I had one property, maybe two properties at the time, and I knew I wanted to do that, but I was just wrapped up in life. I said, from this point forward, I'm always going to tell everybody that I am an investor. From that point forward, literally year after year, bought property after property, every property making me, and these are rental properties, buy and hold rental properties, a minimum of $250 a month in passive income. After 20 to 30 properties, like, man, I don't need to work anymore. Even though I'm making $75,000 a year at this job, I can quit. So I went to my new boss, great boss and everything. I said, boss, I'm laying you off metaphorically. Like, I'm done. This is my two weeks notice. And Bob, I walked to my car. It's about a mile and a half walk. I'm frugal. So I didn't want to pay for parking in downtown Fresno is where I was working. And I felt like I was walking on clouds. Yeah. I walked this walk a thousand times. But if you remember the one where I walked down the hallway where my feet were lead bricks, I was walking to my car, walking on clouds, knowing I would never, ever need a job again because I changed my viewpoint on the value that I give myself. And I said, my goal 
is to never work for somebody again and never let somebody have the ability to rip out my ability to pay for food and mortgage and all that sort of stuff. Because of that, I bought property after property. Eventually, didn't need to work anymore. So there's probably, you probably got questions, but yeah, that's what catapulted me. And everybody needs to realize your value is so much more than anybody could ever pay you. So here, I'm going to pull from the obscure in that story. You were making 250 a property. Now, some people would say, it's 250 bucks. I'm not going to do it for 250 bucks. You're working so hard, you got 250 bucks. Now you get 250 bucks times 10 times 20, like it adds up. But there are some people, I don't know if you see a penny on the ground, if you pick it up or leave it, there's different philosophies on that. But to me, you give me a million pennies, I'm a happy camper, right? If I find a million pennies. Amen. And sometimes I think we discount or we miss opportunities because it's not pretty enough. It's not fancy. It's not cool. And I think a lot of this really comes down to repetitive hard work and focus and intention and staying focused on the ball. Yeah, you're 100% right. Now, if you realize this, I'll give you two scenarios or two thoughts when it comes to rental properties being $250 a month. If you have one property, $250 a month, that's $2,500 extra a year passive income. I literally don't do anything. If you've read that book called Four Hour Work Week, I don't do that. Working four hours a week is for suckers. Like I don't even work 30 minutes a week. I maybe work 30 minutes a month right. on all of my rental property, 30 plus properties now, maybe 30 minutes a month because I built the business so that it runs itself. But here's the thing. If you buy one property, that's $250 a month. That's $2,500 a year. 10 properties is $2,500 a month. That's $30,000 a year without working. 20 properties is $5,000 a month without working, $60,000 without working. And again, here's the second part of it. I started buying properties in 2006. 2006, I bought them one time. I don't do any more work. From then, it's 2000 and almost 22 now. All those years, I've made $250 like clockwork every single month, $2,500 a year. What does that come out to? Like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in the last, you know, let's say 12, 15 years, something like that. And that's just one property. So if you keep thinking about, like you said, Bob, you want to think about a million pennies is a million dollars. We just got to keep moving forward. But here's the biggest thing. I learned passive income. You do work one time, you get paid over and over again. That's the bit I love about real estate. So here's the question, though. I'm the naysayer, right? I'm terrible at picking tenants. And I always tell them, don't worry, pay it next month. And then I'm dealing with evictions <laughs> or I didn't realize that I needed to be more selective with my tenants or I'm not good with plumbing. And the guy just told me it's going to be $20,000 to fix a leak that maybe is really a hundred bucks. I don't have this expertise, so I can never get into real estate. So here's the thing. I make just like you, Bob. I literally can't pick the right tenants. I try to pinch pennies, all this sort of stuff, literally exact same thing. But here's what I do. I build a business first because I want other people to do the work. That's the reason why I work 30 minutes a month is because I literally have other people do the work for me. Let me give you an example of what that looks like. If you're going to build a convenience store, you know, convenience store, candy bars and soda machines and stuff like that, this is what you're not going to do. You're not going to just lease a property or a room or a you know, building, open the doors and put a box of candy bars in there. No, you are not going to do that. You'd go out of business in two seconds. What you will do though, is you'll build the business First, you'll get the gondolas. Those are the shelving units that the candy bars go on. You'll get countertops, cold storage, fountain machines, bank accounts, cash registers, insurance, employees before you buy any inventory. And with that business now running, you can buy inventory, put in your business, start running the business. Same thing with real estate investing. We build the entire business first. We account for everything in the business before we buy any properties. What other people are going to tell you, or people that teach how to invest in real estate, your property is your business. No, that's absolutely wrong. Our properties are our inventory. We buy a piece of inventory and we put it into the business we've already built. That's how we can scale it so much faster because the business is there. We're not doing the work, but here's a great thing, Bob. I'll quickly share on all my properties, 30 plus properties now. I don't pay my taxes. I don't pay my insurance. I don't pay my mortgage. I don't pay my property manager. I don't even pay for repairs. My tenants pay for every bit of those expenses. And here's what it works out to get $250 a month. You add up all your expenses, every single thing we just added up, that's your total. Then you make sure you can rent it out for more than that. Give you an example, it rents for $1,000, but your, maybe your expenses are around $700 a month. 
that's $300 extra in your pocket because you've already accounted for that. Now, you were talking about being a naysayer saying, I don't know how to pick tenants. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to find this, all that sort of stuff. I don't either. That's why I hire experts, my property managers. This is what it looks like to build the business first. Property managers, wholesalers, realtors, inspectors, plumbers, roofers, contractors, electricians. Like We literally hire everybody in the business so that they do the work for us and it's already accounted for in the numbers before I buy the property. Because a lot of people say, well, I can't afford a property manager. You know, it's just taking money. Like I have to, you know, work to pay for the property manager. I'm like, then you bought the property wrong. Sad to say, you didn't do it right. We account for every bit of those expenses, especially a property manager, so that it runs on its own before we buy the property and we make a minimum of $250 a month in passive income. I love all this information because I can hear the wheels turning in people's minds when we talk about this stuff. I'm in LA, so somebody's going to say, well, I can't buy five $2 million (laughs) homes for my inventory, so do I need to be going to Bakersfield? Do I need to be going to Texas to buy my property? Does it all need to be in my backyard? It 100% does not. So in 2006, when I first started investing, remember, 2008 was a crash. But I started investing in 2006. I lived in Fresno, California. I know Bakersfield because that's literally right between Fresno and LA. But I lived in Fresno, California. And even then, if I bought a house, I could not rent it for enough, like high enough to make passive income. So I actually started investing in Ohio. Now I invest in Ohio, Texas, and Arizona. And I have students that literally invest all over the country. But here's the great thing. I build the business. I make sure that the experts do the work. And they're the ones that are going to make sure that I do the business right. And we can do this anywhere. We can do it in our backyard. I personally don't like to because I'm the type of personality. I'm a doer. So if I find out that there's a toilet leaking over there, I'll literally drive at 2 a.m. because I'm going to save some money. I'm frugal. So I'm going to save some money and do that. But if it's literally states away, I can't do that. I'm forced to build the business right. So all the expenses are accounted for. But here's the thing. You can duplicate this in any city that you want to invest in. So I would not suggest buying a million dollar home and making $250 a month if you have one mortgage payment that, you know, let's say tenants move out, you're one month without a mortgage payment or a rent coming in and you need to make that mortgage payment, there goes all of your passive income. So what we like to do is like find good properties that are lower in price. Let's say, and this can be my shock to some people who live on the coastlines, but let's say you buy an $80,000 house. Yes, there are houses that are $80,000. Midwest are fantastic. Southeast and the Carolinas and the Florida, great areas of the country. Rents are higher in a sense compared to the amount that you can actually buy it for. Let's say you buy a house for $80,000. It rents for maybe $1,000, but your expenses are $700. That's $300 you can actually put in your pocket. But the biggest thing is we build the business so we have the experts on the ground. Like somebody might go to Zillow and say, Zillow, let's look up this property. Okay, they're asking this much. This is how much we might be able to rent it for. Zillow is not an expert. Trulia, Realtor, like all those dot-coms, They are not the experts. Who is the expert though? It's the person that is literally on the ground, working there, living there, knowing that area. It's so awesome when I bring to my property manager, hey, property manager, I'm gonna buy this property. At least my goal is to buy this property. Tell me how much I could rent it for, what type of clientele I'm gonna expect, you know, vacancy factor, how fast they're gonna move out. And they're gonna say, oh man, I have a house literally right around the corner, same exact house. It rents for, let's say $1,300 because I just got that two months ago you could probably get $1,300. That is so much more valuable than any website, any database, because you have experts. Just in any, any business, you want to hire the experts. I love hiring people that are smarter than me. Like, it, Bob, you're much smarter than me. And most likely, all of your listeners are much smarter than me. We just need to hire the right people to do the work for us. So we don't have to be a rocket scientist to make this stuff work. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> well, I'll give you one quick example, Bob. Like, you're an accountant, so numbers really stick in your brain. I'm the opposite of that. If I think of a number, it goes in my brain and then it literally flutters away and it disappears. It's really sad. I feel, I'm like, oh my goodness, I just got gypped on my brain. But I don't have to worry about that because it's simple. Addition, subtraction, and a little bit of multiplication. You add up your expenses, that's your total expenses. You figure out how much you could rent it for, then you subtract the two, that's your passive income. Multiplication is just, like I said earlier, you get 10 properties, that's $30,000 a year. 20 properties, 60, and so on and so forth. So one of the things that I'm thinking as you're talking, and I think this goes back to mindset and about, am I trying to have a lifestyle or am I trying to build wealth? Because some people are going to say, well, that's just not sexy enough. I want it to be sexy. And 
the reality is when we're building wealth, it's not really about how sexy it is. It's about how effective we're doing our job. Would you agree with that or what's your thought? 100%. Whatever sexy is in the eye of the beholder, like it's sure. however anybody views it. To me, sexy was quitting my job at 37 years old. Like that was like, yeah, that's fantastic. Right. And at the same time, I also have generational wealth. Like nobody listening to this, if you have a job, you cannot pass your job, your J-O-B, working for somebody else to your kids. No, they have to be interviewed. They have to go through the exact same process of being hired. You can't give that to your kids. All of my rental properties, all the kids in my picture in the background, I will literally give these to my kids and teach them how to actually invest and do this right. Any business now, because I have 40 plus hours of my life and I'm not working for somebody else, I create business after business. In fact, right now, I'm literally creating a real estate investor conference. It's called the Real Estate Wealth Builders Conference. And with that conference, I'm creating a whole new business, employing people, providing great value to people. And this is something I potentially give to my kids. So even though it might not be sexy, I would rather be able to go play golf whenever I want, go hang out with my kids and not work for a job and be considered not sexy. Hey, that's fine with me. Yeah. I love not being <laughs> sexy. I love being around my kids. I love being able to do whatever I want whenever I want. Absolutely. And it seems to me that a lot of people out there, we want to get rich quick. We want to make these things happen. It really becomes about mindset. And one of the things in this mindset that I've found an important piece is giving back or paying it forward or giving to others. And a lot of people, wow, I'm not here to, like for me, if I'm not giving forward, if I'm not being of service, why do you do what you do? Because you could just go make your money and go with your kids to the Grand Canyon. You don't need to go help some other people. You know, you've got all these properties. Why are you going to take your time and do all this other stuff? Why? A lot of people say that's a good question, but this is actually a really fantastic question because you start to think of mindset. Now for me, getting over that mindset of working one hour and getting paid an hour, that was a huge transition. Then becoming an investor, then becoming building businesses. And you only get this type of mindset as you're progressing through it. If you're just working a day job, it's hard to get this. But let me give you an example or explain this out. So there are four legacies that we want to leave in our life. Number one, the legacy we want is a money legacy. Basically, have enough money to buy whatever you want. Buy the car that you want instead of the one that you need. And travel the world or do whatever you want. So money legacy is first, where we don't have to work for somebody else. That's the first one. Second one is a time legacy, to have the time to do whatever you want, whenever you want. You decide your own. So that's the second one. The third one is a relationship legacy. So first one's money, second one's time. So money affords you time, time affords you a relationship legacy. Being able to be with your kids, you know, coach their little league games or take your spouse out to dinner, you know, serve or do whatever you want because you have now time. The first three afford you to do the last one. This is, I'm blessed to be at this stage now. The last one is a service legacy. Like I could continually grow the business and just make more money, but I'm not like Rockefeller. Rockefeller said, when he asked the question, how much money is enough? He said, just a little bit more. Like, that's not for me. I'm totally fine not being sexy and being fine, just you know living my life serving people. So money affords me the time. Time affords me the relationships. Now my relationships, I'm blessed to be really solid. Now I can serve as many people as possible. But here's a great thing, Bob. In serving, it's not like I don't get anything back. Number one, I get back great relationships of serving other people. I also get knowledge from learning from other people. I even just get the sense of, man, I helped this person out. This is so fantastic. In fact, my students, when they buy their first property, I get so elated like I bought my first property all over again. So it's such a huge thing to be able to serve. But here's also another great thing about service. Service, it also blesses more and more people. I found, as I figure out to serve more people, the more people that I serve, the better my life gets and the better other people's lives get. And so as I have that now service legacy, which you're 100% right, Bob, people either don't like the quote unquote give back or just give. It's just service. That's really what it comes down to. If you can get to the point where you have the money, then it affords you the time. Time affords you the relationships. Then you have the service it makes life so much more enjoyable because you're grateful for everything you have and you're also blessing other people at the same time. Yeah, I think that's so important. And regardless of what you call it, I mean, I know that I had so many people that helped me along the way that it feels only right to be able to pay that forward because there are people that believed in me even when I didn't believe in me. And those lifts 
that got me to where I am, I have gratitude and I want to be able to, if I can't pay it back to them, I want to at least pay it forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Dustin, we are at our Fast Five, which is brought to you by Greenlight. Shine a little light on the world of money. With the Greenlight debit card and app, kids earn money through chores, set saving goals, spend wisely, and invest. Parents set flexible controls and get real-time notifications every time their kids spend money. Check out Greenlight. Few questions, five of them right here. Who manages the finances in your household? Is it you, your wife, or is it a team effort? So when we first were learning how to just make more money and build business, my wife was absolutely it, taking care of all finances. She's smart. I'm not. But now, honestly, when you make more money, everything goes away. Like you should continue to budget, but you don't have to worry about these sort of things. Can I afford this? Yes, you can because you make more money. So right now, my wife just focuses on homeschooling. Like I said, she has the hard job of homeschooling. I got the easy job of making money. So I just make more money to fix all the problems that I come into. There you go. That works. If you had the ability to travel back in time and change one financial decision you made, what would it be? I think it would be to start getting passive income sooner. I love passive income where I work one time. It could be writing a book and getting paid over and over again. It could be making a song. It could be creating a podcast that people listen to over and over again. Passive income. I found that when I was like 26 and I was 26, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And then that's when I said, okay, 10 years. In 10 years, I'm going to quit my job. I was 37 by the time I quit my job. So I was really blessed to do that. But if I would have found it at 16, yeah. I might have quit when I was 26. So passive income is by far the number one thing. Absolutely. How would you explain financial success to a first grader? Financial success for me is where you are independent of other people giving you money for the time that you put in, where you can control basically whether or not you feed your family or not. That's what I think financial success is. Absolutely. Do you hope that your kids will follow you into real estate or do you encourage them to just do whatever they want to do? Yeah, 100% in real estate because it's so simple. Like I said, like this isn't easy. If it was easy, everybody would do real estate, but it's a simple process. You literally just do X, Y, and Z. You just need, some people need like a little coaching. That's what I also do is I help them by coaching them, just getting that over that hurdle. In fact, one specific student said, I don't know about buying this property. And I'm like, if you don't buy this, I will buy it. Give it to me. And like, oh, that was a catalyst to get, get them over to buy it. But I will absolutely teach my kids how to do this. And here's a big thing, Bob. I'm not going to give my kids money to go to college. I'm going to say, if you're going to spend 50 grand, 60 grand and go to college, how about I give you a loan for 50 to $60,000, zero interest. You buy the house, you buy your first house and you start making passive income, pay me back. And then we could do it all over again. So I am absolutely for them doing that. Plus I'm also for them figuring out what type of business. My daughter literally wants to be a YouTube person doing like homemaking stuff, baking and sewing and all that stuff. My sons want to do YouTube with outdoors, you know, hunting and all that sort of stuff. So I just encourage them to think outside of working for somebody else. That's awesome. If you won the lottery, would you tell people or keep it a secret? Oh, I would absolutely not tell anybody. <laughs> I would absolutely keep it a secret, 100%. Plus, my wife is, she's very reserved when it comes to finances. Like all this, you know, my podcast and I, I can't, she doesn't want me to talk about any numbers and how much we make and all that sort of stuff. But I respect that. And I say, okay, I'll just keep, you know, going without saying that. That's too funny. <laughs> okay, so we're at our m M&M moment, our money and motivation sweet spot. And I'm wondering if you have a piece of, wealth wisdom or a practical financial tip that you can share with our listeners? Well, I love the book, Richest Man in Babylon. And I learned the aspect of paying yourself first, because I always thought paying myself first would be paying my bills, like the rent or whatever it might be. That's not paying yourself first is where you save that money. You pay yourself and you hold on that money. It doesn't go to paying your cell phone bill or whatever, but it allows you to use that money to make more money in the future, passive income, investing, all that sort of stuff. So I absolutely love paying myself first and then everybody else, bills and creditors all come after that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And don't go into debt. You said something earlier. hundred percent. I know this is so obvious to everybody, but when you actually spend below your means, <laughs> you come out really good. And I know so many people that overestimate their income and underestimate their expenses and they come up short all the time. If you do it in reverse, underestimate your income, overestimate your expenses, you're going to come out with some extra cash and you'll be able to do the things that you want to do. So absolutely. Some of the stuff that I really appreciated, I appreciate this talking about being frugal. It sounds so much better than being cheap, which I have been accused of. I like frugal. 
sometimes it is hard to part with a dollar, but also knowing when to part with the dollar because sometimes parting with it actually serves me much better. But the other thing I heard was even with losing the job, the layoff, you didn't see it as being a victim or blaming. You, in that moment, found another job in another department. Like you didn't let what seemingly might be a fail or an obstacle, you turn around and said, wait, how do I take this and make my lemonade, basically? So I appreciate that. And I really appreciate this piece about paying it forward, being of service. I think that is so key. The more we can be grateful and humbled and pay it forward, I think the more enriched our lives are all the time, without question. Absolutely. Dustin, where can people find you online and social media? And I believe you have an offer. So please share that. Yeah, I absolutely do. So I just love sharing with people, uh, just serving people, showing them how to invest in real estate. So I actually have a free real estate investing course. So anybody can literally get to show you how to build the business first, how to make $250 a month, how to scale the business, how to quit your job with it. So if you text the word rental, R-E-N-T-A-L to 33777, rental to 33777, or go to master passiveincome.com forward slash free course, all one word forward slash free course. I will literally give that to you. You can get started. I've had so many students just utilize that and start investing. Plus I also have my podcast, Master Passive Income Podcast. It's literally just me teaching how to do this. Just that's all. I don't do interviews. It's literally just me teaching Master Passive Income YouTube channel. Same thing, teaching how to do this. But also I have successfully unemployed podcasts. That's where I get to serve even more people. I just brought you on Bob to the podcast where you got to share how you did it and how other people can do it too. Successful employees where I interview awesome people like you, Bob, experts who've done it that can show us how to do it. So those are just all the ways that I can give back. But yeah, you can check me out on all those. Well, Dustin, thanks so much. I really appreciate you giving all your wisdom to our listeners and giving them some resource. I hope everybody had something to take away from this. And I look forward to seeing everybody like paying it forward and having that full life that everybody wants. Dustin, thank you again so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Did you learn something new about your relationship to money today? Maybe you have a friend who has some financial blocks or beliefs that are holding them back. Please share this podcast so they too can get off the roller coaster ride of financial fears and journey towards financial freedom. To learn how to have a healthy relationship with money, visit themoneynerve.com. That's nerve, not nerd. We'll be back next week with another perspective on money and the emotions that bind us.